In my last video, I got into the unbelievable video, which was a debate between Glenn Scrivener and Matt Delahunty on the question, can atheism deliver a better world? And what I, thinking about it more, had the question of, is secular humanism more fragile than Christianity? And if so, why? The idea that, that Tom Holland and Jordan Peterson seem to have is that the achievements that we have enjoyed in the West are the fruit of Christianity. And the fears that they have, Douglas Murray is right in this group too, the fears that they have is that without a living, breathing, vibrant religion like Christianity that has delivered these things, whether society will in fact be able to maintain the kind of respect for individual human rights that it currently enjoys. And, and it seems that this respect, which is costly, as is clear in this video, well, what leads people to make costly, often sacrificial, theoretical sometimes, sacrifices for another? So I want to jump into this video again and play some more of it, and then I've got quite a few other videos to share along the way. This could be a long one, so here we go. Dum -de -dum -de -dum. Here we go. I mean, I, wa I want to move us on from what is a very sure. interesting theological debate at this point. Now, now I, at some point, I do want to address both the slavery question, which comes up all the time in these debates, and, and also the the blood sacrifice question, because I think actually Rene Girard uh, treats the blood sacrifice issue quite well, and the slavery issue, I'm not sure, is is the the kind of uh, slam dunk that that the celebrity atheists think it is. Well, it may move us back a bit to to the central thesis of of this sure. whole thing. Um, I mean, we've been asking, can atheism deliver a be better world? We're talking about this in the context of morality, Matt. Um, first of all. From the outset, what, what do you say just to that question? We haven't even asked that yet. Can atheism deliver a better world? What, what's your sort of... I have no idea. I've never suggested that atheism or even secular humanism guarantees a better world. Um, first of all, we're always dealing with human beings. And so you can come up with whatever, whatever rule system you want. And it, it's like, I, I, got a, I got a thing wrong on the show the other day. Somebody was talking about natural family planning. And I confused it with the rhythm method and I kind of mm. mocked it. There's not, nothing wrong with natural family planning other than you have to actually follow it diligently. And it will result in you having sex less often. Mm. Uh, and then in, within the Roman Catholic Church, they are required to just abstain rather than using alternate things yeah. in, mm. during fertility. Uh, there's nothing, I'm not saying that secular humanism it guarantees a better world. But even if we take what Glenn's saying, even if you were to look at this as Christianity light without the God thing, I would already view that as better because A, we guarantee that we have human's best interests at heart. That's humanism. It's the, it's the foundation of it. You, uh, again, you, you just have to, we guarantee we have human's best interests at heart. That's not necessarily a self that, that doesn't set up your decisions to self-evident and obvious solutions in every case. Um, the road to hell is paved with good intentions is an old saying and one that continues to prove quite reliably true. So fair enough on that point, but there needs to be more. You can, you can say, and you would be correct, that it's just a bold, bald assertion that we should care about humans, okay? I, I have no response to that. I, I don't even know why anybody would want to come up with a response. There's nothing that says... This leads into my question. Is this secular humanism that Matt Delhunty is talking, is this more fragile than Christianity? Because it's a, let's say, it's that this bold, bare assertion out there. It's just plain, regular speciesism, and, and we're committed to it. Okay. I tend to think that's fragile because lots of other ideas are going to come down the road with lots of other justifications. The world will be better this way, except for this. I did a debate in a Church of Christ where I told them I could write a better book than the Bible and I could prove it to them. 
because I could rewrite it word for word, reverse its position on slavery, and it would be a better book. Because for the people who are looking at this... And, and that's, you know, that's something I'd like to talk about, but I don't want to stop here yet. Because again, the slavery issue... <laughs> I, it would be interesting to me how he imagines he could test his claim. And because he says, well, it's just, it's just self-evident. But the thing is that the Bible has been run through how many different cultures, how many different places, how many different times. See, I would argue that, well, actually, the Bible has the book of Philemon in it, which, in fact, addresses slavery in a deeper, better way than if Matt Dillahunty just said, no slaves, because the Bible already says things like, well, you know, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. And those things being in the Bible doesn't make people, doesn't make these things doesn't eradicate these things from human history. Because, again, as I've said in many videos before, the Bible doesn't actually work that way, and people don't work that way. Not so much as metaphorical lessons or like that. If they're looking at this as an instruction book for life, that book advocates slavery. It... Uh, okay, and again, the Bible is not an instruction book for life as such, per se. It's, it's simply not how the Bible is written. That's not even a question. If you were to say, thou shalt not own a human being as property, that would be better than saying you can and that you can pass them on. And so this was the example I used for the people who, who are kind of like Bible worshipers, not the people who go in looking for, hey, there's an interesting message here, or they're going to tell me something about my life, but no, 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 this is literally word for word. Blah. And, and this will often come up too. And again, you can, if you've never listened to Richard Dawkins on Unbelievable, that's a very interesting listen. It's back in the archives, but you know Richard Dawkins basically says the same thing. Well, I'm not really talking about nice Christians like the kind that that Justin Brierley has on the program. I'm talking about all those other people. But to address this question of whether or not secular humanism is more fragile than Christianity, we have to, in fact, think about all those other people. Uh, you know, that that type of mindset is probably more responsible for the harm and damage that a lot of us would lay at the foot of Christianity than Glenn's version, for sure. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think Glenn's pro-slavery at all. And when you start looking at things that, that uh, where, where you are finding a way to take a message that could easily be viewed as this is a blood magic sacrifice and say, well, life has to consume life to exist. And you want to kind of maybe blow off why God would have made it that way or why it had to be made that way, which is a weird and interesting theological discussion. Getting rid of those things and keeping the good parts is all I've advocated for ever. And secular humanism to me is taking the good parts, whether they're found in Christianity, Judaism, Scientology. And, and who's deciding on, in a sense, and the good is simply de defined by what you regard as the measure of human well-being and yeah. anything that basically points us in that direction. Yeah, and it's not as the moral. and it's not fully defined or anything else. But to pretend that we don't have some beginning understanding of it, I think is a bit ridiculous. Okay. So what? You know, if, I mean, so so I think very briefly, in a sense, that Matt is sketching out this this idea that that there is a, a secular morality. Well, there's an example that came along with this that Glenn produced when he was listing off societal health versus religiosity yeah. and teeing me up for the Gregory S. Paul thing. Mm. Uh, he mentioned divorce rates. But that comes with the presumption that divorce is a bad thing. Sure. And I don't believe that. I, I'm recently divorced. Me and my ex-wife are mm -hmm. as good friends now as we ever were and better. And we're both in agreement that it was absolutely the right thing for us to do. And so what's happened here is from my... It would be interesting to pursue that line of questioning. What, what exactly... You're, you're as good of friends as you used to be. So, so what exactly has the divorce now offered you that the marriage didn't? My perspective. And obviously people can disagree. Religious thinking, religious teaching, religious dogma has done a number of great disservices to human beings by setting up a notion of a soulmate, by setting up the notion that marriage needs to be... I've been watching The Good Place lately, and uh, I, I'm not, I, 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 I know for a fact you can't lay soulmate at the feet of Christianity. One man, one, man, one woman, forever. That's caused countless problems. By setting up uh, a view of death that does not allow people to deal with that. If we, if we started with the notion that 
death is the eventual consequence of life, it would fundamentally change. And that, that was the end, as far as we knew, and anything else would be a bonus. It would fundamentally change, I think. And, and this is another issue. And again, read Miroslav Volf, um, Exclusion and Embrace, looking at the, U, the Civil War in Yugoslavia, where there's no afterlife jeopardy, no afterlife judgment, what that does in terms of people's demand to enact justice in this realm with their own hands and where that goes. Thank you how we treated people while they were still alive. And so there's a number of problems here that are rooted in the theology, rooted in the notion that there's a God, which I think if you get set those aside and just focus on the things that actually directly try to benefit human beings, it has to be okay. better. So it's, it's all the benefits of Christianity plus a few more because you haven't got some of the baggage, essentially. Well, you know, I mean, Matt said that um, he could write a, bi a Bible that's superior to the Bible by reversing his position on slavery. I think if you started from scratch without the Bible, though, um, I don't think you and I don't think anyone has written a, a book or a series of books or a collection of books, a library of books, that has done what the Bible has done for slavery in the world. Because slavery is a, a human universal, um, and it has not been overturned by anyone other than those who took the Bible seriously back in the 18th century. Now, if you read... Um, Dominion, Tom Holland's Dominion, and you get into some of the later chapters where he talks about abolition and how the British forced that on the Islamic world and how that comes back around at the very recently with the Islamic State. It's really very fascinating. Um, the the point that Glenn makes here is 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 really made quite sharply in Dominion in the chapter entitled Love, which I think that chapter is a masterpiece. They were evangelical Christians, they were Quakers, they were people who took the Bible seriously. So Parts of it seriously. Well, what, yeah, well, you, it's a longer discussion about how you take the Old Testament. But that, that's got to be interesting, at least, because, I mean, we can't do a compare and contrast. There's no A-B testing about this. Okay, there's only there's Which only I think kind of undermines what you were just saying. And I, 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 sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, mm -hmm. I'm in agreement with you. Mm -hmm. You're viewing it as nobody else has done this and you don't think anybody else could. And my thing is, we have no way to find that out because we live in a world where this is the way things happened. And so... T I think um, Matt Dillahunty or Sam Harris or Steven Pinker could all take a shot at rewriting the Bible if they wanted to. Nobody's stopping them. The Bible's in public domain. Take as much of it as you want. Go ahead and publish it. Publish it. Under a pseudonym, um, you know, many of these people now have the reach with social media to promote it and see where it goes. To, to argue that you couldn't actually write a list of moral precepts from scratch that are superior to Christianity. Well, but then, but then aren't, aren't you saying, um, okay, at, at least with the Christian side, we've got that there is one group of people that has guaranteed universal equality for all human beings and has ended the slave trade. Okay, it might have taken far longer than you would have wanted it to have taken. But there is one group of people who have done that. We don't know if anyone has or could do that. Let's give it a go anyway. Let's, let's walk away from this thing that has given us all these benefits of the universities and the hospitals and the schools and the scientific method and the emancipation of the slaves and all this sort of stuff. Um, let's, let's walk away from that. that. That's quite a leap of faith, don't you think? And, and am I also getting the sense, Glenn, that... I mean, I, I want to come back to this, this human at the center of this and the fact mm. that Matt says, hey, humans are humans, and yet mm. it's, mm. it's natural that we're going to prefer ourselves, and that's where the morality comes from, our own best interests. Mm. Um, and you're saying, no, somehow Christianity has actually grounded a, an intrinsic dignity to the human that Matt's godless ethics isn't necessarily going to support. It might go in that direction for them for a moment, but there's no ultimate foundation to it. Is that what I'm Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are always going to look after ourselves, but who is we and who are ourselves in that conversation? And we are always wanting to narrow the circle around us and our mates and exclude the other tribe and exclude the other kinds of people. So, you know, in, in the news here in the UK, um, just recently they, they brought in a, a non-invasive prenatal test uh, for Down syndrome. And it had the reliable effect that everybody knew it was going to have, as people knew that they were going to have children with Down syndrome, they aborted them at ever higher rates. And yet the, uh, the, the headlines said, um, uh, children with Down syndrome down 
And it sounded like people had like, found a cure for Down syndrome or something like that. Um, they hadn't found a cure for Down syndrome. They'd just drawn the circle around humanity and kept those with that condition on the outside and wanted to eliminate them. Uh, and that, to me, is a very chilling way of uh, proceeding with a kind of a, a, a humanism. Because that's, that's always the danger. Like, who is us? Who, who are those who we, we are going to grant with the right to life? And who are those who we are going to say, ah, they do not qualify? And it's always tempting for the, for the humans to say, okay, it's the strong who will make the decision and it's the weak who must take the hindmost. Um, what is it, you know, what is it that's going to stand up for all humans, regardless of capacity, regardless of attributes, regardless of achievements? Um, who is it who's going to stand up for all humans and actually be true humanists and grant them human rights too? See, this, is, this is the problem is, so first of all, whether or not that abortion scenario that you're talking about is humanism or not is subject for a whole other debate. But you're, you say, well, nobody could do this. And then when we talk about here's a list of precepts where we don't include a God in it, then your answer is now you're just borrowing from Christianity. It's Christianity light and you've just removed the God. And then the, the other objection that you're going to launch to second morality is what's going to be the foundation beyond this? We, at least we have a foundation. It's God. Well, what if people don't accept your foundation? That is exactly the same objection that you are leveraging, you're launching at secular humanism. The, the, whatever problems secular humanism may have with regard to foundations of ethics, no religious foundation has any way of solving that. Because ultimately, if and, until some god comes in and says, I am in fact the god of the universe and I am the moral authority, and people are forced to recognize that this is the case, then the only thing... People are forced to recognize that this is the case. It's not like Romans 1 hasn't touched on this. It's happening is Glenn saying God is the foundation of morality, and I'm saying humans are. And nobody is going to be, n neither of those systems is going to work for people who don't accept that that's a foundation. Do, do people have to all recognize this foundation in order for it to be the foundation? No, people don't need to recognize that 2 plus 2 equals 4 for it to be the case that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and for you to go to your grave proclaiming that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Even if the whole world said it was otherwise, then 2 plus 2 would still equal 4. People don't need to recognize a moral truth to be a moral truth for it to be moral. Um, they do if, they're gonna, if you're talking about a moral system. If you want to create you know, uh, computer code and get people to start programming in it, you've got to be able to convince them mm -hmm. about ones and zeros. Yeah. So 2 plus 2 plus equals 4 isn't even in the same ballpark of there is a God. It's either true or it's not, but it's not a foundation for something. If you're talking about a moral system, the only, the, the, the true foundation is agreement on what the foundation is, that, that the three of us care about human beings. And then we can start arguing about how much we care and where there's going to be conflicts and everything else. But as long we can't do any of that until we agree on that foundation. And if Glenn's foundation is there's a God at the bottom of this and he can't demonstrate that, then we're not even going to get started on solving that's, the problem. That's not what 2 plus 2 equals 4 is um, the, the analog of in this conversation. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is the analog of um, all human beings are worthy of provision and protection. All of them. Right? Do you, would you agree with that? All, human, all members of the human family, no matter what their achievements, no matter what their attributes, all members of the human family are worthy of all provision and protection. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. It's definitely a problem, especially when you've got people who are discovering disabled children in the womb. When I, when I say I have no idea, it's about that simplification. I, I, my instinct is, of course, to say yes. Mm. It's a very Christian instinct. Thank you. <laughs> That's a very atheist response. <laughs> the instinct, of course, say yes. The problem is that when we start talking about the specific in the language, there are going to be rights conflicts that we have to address. Sure, but all other things being equal, as a general principle, would you say that what Glenn has laid down there is, is, is one that you could agree to, the importance of treating sure, all members of the Sure, in the, the general colloquial sense, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's your point then, Glenn, that, that this 2 plus 2 equals 4, as it were, mm -hmm. this agreed agreement, mm -hmm. that, that, it, that doesn't exist just on the basis of Matt's preferences, 
it's, right. a, it's a fact in the way two plus two equals four is a fact, for, yes. as far as you're concerned. Yes. See, and that not, I don't, not quite so that much I don't, for that you. I don't agree with. It, mm -hmm. it is, yeah. it is certainly there. There are things that we're going to agree on. See, and, and actually, I agree with Delahante on this point because it isn't the kind of thing that two plus two. I, I understand that that Glenn is saying it's the kind of thing like two plus two equals four, but two plus two equals four is 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 a thing that was obvious to the Greeks and it's been obvious to people for a very long time in a way that this has not been obvious to people. Um, that I don't know how you could ever demonstrate that this is in fact like true, like some intrinsic truth about the, like for example, I think human lives have incredible value. I don't think they have any intrinsic value. I don't mm -hmm. think the universe cares at all about mm -hmm. human life. They have value because they have value to us. Mm -hmm. And who's us? Humans. Mm -hmm. Old humans? Well, well cognitive, it, it, able humans I, I who are my, able to consider the, the proposition of whether or not they have value. Which is the strong, and, and, and that's, that's my problem, is that it, it becomes an ever-shrinking circle of humanity that we have, and it's the strong who rule over the weak. Well, the characterization of evolution as being strong over the weak, I, I would argue isn't necessarily accurate, but it's also be, because there's no decision there. It's whatever mm -hmm. survives, survives. And what is strong in one sense a weakness may become a strength depending on the, the situation. Okay, now we're into Darwin, and that's going to be important because I think I played a lot of this before in the previous video, but where Justin's going to take this now is really important. Mm -hmm. That's what evolution does. It's not like, ooh, me, he, man, you weak, I'm going to kill you type thing. Maybe, you know, for example, sickle cell anemia provides uh, protection against certain things, and so while it may be under certain circumstances, there's a reason why animals develop camouflage and other changes. That's but, but because why, why, of the why in your view the was it wrong for, you know, I'm sorry to invoke Godwin's law, even though we're near, near the end of the program, uh, why was it wrong for Hitler and the Nazis to, uh, you know, euthanize uh, disabled people and gay people and people that they felt were outside of their, their circle of who they considered to be human? What's, why, what, what was the kind of... I'm know, not convinced the, they considered them outside the circle of what they considered to be human. They had a view that these were somehow inferior humans. I think they would all acknowledge they were human. We're going to get into this. Just that they were somehow inferior or inferior less races. or less diverging, yeah, yeah. race, uh, yeah. yeah, things like, like that. We're going to get into this because this comes up with Tom Holland, which I'm going to play part of that video too, and this has set me on side of a Jordan Peterson s quest to really find out what the Nazis and Adolf Hitler thought, and so so we are going to get into that in this video so this isn't this isn't the only video i'm going to play in this video by any means like i said this is going to be a long one the race so it's one of those things where people say because a lot of people would say hitler was wrong about a fact there whereas from what i'm i'm wondering like and we're getting to the issue of is there this objective moral value to human to humanity and in well, a sense, it reminds me of the people who argue that you know hey slavery is really good for the slave owners and so if you're a slave owner you can look at this and say, hey, slavery is a good thing because it benefits me. The problem is, is that when you look at the larger picture, it's actually not necessarily good for the slave owners. And what Dillahunty recognizes right there is, again, well, it looks good here. It doesn't look good there. It looks good at this point in time to me. It doesn't look good at this point in time to someone else. And this, of course, is is always the challenge that we have in making these judgments in real time and then of course with institutions and so on and so forth these things scale up and get beginning to recognize that uh, every member of society affects potentially every other member fundamentally changes and and it shifts our in-group out-group dynamic so that when hitler goes after the jews for whatever religious reasons he had for whatever and we're gonna have to get at why did hitler go after the jews uh superior you know, uber guy. Were they religious reasons? Well, scientific reasons he reasons, had. Yeah. Um, scientific reasons? That's fundamentally different from whether or not killing them makes society worse or better. How do you know? How do you know? So this is, this is why I wanted to play it up until this point. Let's get to that this version of the slide, because does it make society worse or society better? Now, we're, eh, I wonder if I want to put this one in here now or, or save it till later. Um,
we're going to save it for later. I'm going to go right to the, the Tom Holland video at this point. The Tom Holland Delling Pod conversation I thought was a, an excellent one. They, they got to so many things in that conversation. And so Justin in there invoked, you know, Godwin's Law that basically, you know, by the time someone brings up the Nazis in a conversation, it sort of jumped the shark. Tom Holland makes the point in this video that, well, he makes two points one of which was totally new to me when I heard it, was the relationship between Nazis and sort of a green movement, uh, kind of an environmentalism. I had no idea what that connection was was about. But but then also he made the observation that, that Nazis have become your, your, your typical stand-in for evil. And in fact, Tom Holland makes the point that in our conversations, Nazis have sort of replaced kind of a traditional Christian narrative about. Oh, and here I didn't put the, there I didn't put the, the link into where that is in the. Hang on. Okay, here it is. More generally, the kind of what, what you might describe as kind of wishy-washy thought for the day. Yes, um, can't bear it. Uh, Kill them all. Liberal Democrat form of, of Christianity. Yeah. Um, we we are living through a kind of ideological upheaval that, that that bears comparison with the Protestant Reformation, and what happened in the Protestant Reformation is that people is that say priests, scholars, people in the universities have to adjust to a new way of understanding the the, the, the Christian inheritance, and if you don't, then you become an outsider, and ultimately you you know you risk being executed as a kind of Catholic recusant. Um, I think that what's happening now is that um, the long centuries of Protestant England, we're now entering kind of post-Protestant state right. where we, we where where the, the the prestige that previously had attached to Protestant Christianity is now attached to a kind of post-Protestant Christianity, and Which the is and what? just as just as just as Catholics in the Protest in the Reformation had to kind of either accommodate themselves or convert themselves to the new form of the faith or go into a kind of embittered opposition. Yeah. So the same thing is now is happening with, with the, the, the Protestant churches and, of course, the Catholic Church as well, but let's stick with the Protestant church. And this is a very interesting point, something that a little later I'm going to play a conversation that um, from the American Enterprise Institute that Ross Duthat, Duthat I never know how to say his name, um, hosts with respect to this in this post protestant this post protestant environment where on, on one hand it's more secular and increasingly mo also religious but religious in a different way than christendom maybe maybe not that's what that conversation gets into it's a very interesting video i'm only going to play pieces of it but the whole video is fascinating so so the Either you resist it and you you know you proudly use the book of you know Cranmer and and yeah. and and uh, King James version. And, am I weird? Uh, no, I'm not uh, weird. I'm not. Or or you um or you kind of accommodate to it and eff effectively you you kind of sign up to the new orthodoxy and um you you you, you talk in a way that ultimately you know there's no need for you really to be a practicing Christian at all because um you know you. You know, you might as well be a liberal democrat. It's not that. It's, so, yeah. so I, th so I think that, that I, I, and so I think that the, the the churches have lost self confidence. I think they've lost the, any sense of authority. I think they've lost um, the, uh, the the kind of certitude that in previous generations enabled them to um, speak with prophetic voices. I, I don't think they do that anymore. I think that they they feel kind of a vague sense of embarrassment. I mean, not not, not everyone, of course, but 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 I think that's a kind of slight paralyzing sense at the moment. Uh, now there was something. Oh, oh yes, environmentalism. So I do think that that um, there is a huge tension um, between environmentalism and humanism, and generally this generally they get conflated. If and and this is this gets into this question that I opened this video with: is is humanism fragile? And now, obviously, environmentalism is right now assumed to be an existential threat for the future of civilization on this planet, nearly to the same degree as 
nuclear annihilation during the Cold War. And again, that's that's debated and go ahead and debate it in the comment section. But that's that's the existential threat that is driving people. And, and the, the main question here is, can humanism be held on to without the religious uh, the religious movement that brought it to the fore. If you're a humanist, then you're also likely to be an environmentalist. Humanism is clearly Christian. Humanism is basically Christianity without Christ because it's founded on the idea that humans are special. And if you get doubts about this, read Dominion. He makes a, you know, it's... He makes a, some some of the chapters in particular the, the chapter entitled Love he may and and the introduction to the book that and the audio book he reads himself the rest of the book is is read by someone else but he, I think he makes a very strong argument and he's not alone in making this argument but it's one of the things that I think the book is the book is excellent with is weaving is showing how in these cultural struggles that we've been in Christianity is so often on both sides of them, which is which is strange, and that the 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 tensions within Christianity get played out, and so you know it, it's really in some ways John Calvin in his commentary in Genesis where God is wrestling with Jacob. Um, John Calvin makes the point that you know with his left hand. God fights Jacob, but with his right hand, he fights for him. And you almost get the sense in, in many times and places that, that that's sort of some of that movement going on in, in, in the story of the story of the Christian West. And that's a theological notion. And it goes back to the book of Genesis and the idea that God created man and woman in his image. Yeah. And that affords an incredible dignity to humans. I mean, you know, there's no other belief system that that, that offers anything like that to humans. Um, and to say that that, that 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 humans have a special status, that 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 you can have something called humanism, is clearly drawing on that. Even if if humanists don't necessarily want to acknowledge that, um, against that, envir environmentalism is is founded on the conviction that humans are bad for the planet and and increasingly bad for the planet, and that we are poisoning it, and we're wiping out vast numbers of species, have wiped out vast numbers of species that there are too many of us, that we're spreading everywhere, and probably the best thing for the planet would be if we'd never existed. And that being so, perhaps we should all just, you know, wipe ourselves out. You've summed it up pretty well. So, so there is clearly a tension there between the notion that humans are great and, 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 and the kind of implicit idea that we're all a plague. And so the, the way that this is squared is to... is to try and campaign for um, the reduction of human influence on the planet without facing up to <laughs> the obvious way to reduce human influence on the planet, which is... The babies! You've got to eat the babies! To wipe out humanity. Well, some of them do. Some of them, you know, the, <laughs> some of them the, the voluntary and, human and, extinction yes, movement. And, and, so it, and so it does... And so there is always the, the, the chance that, um, that environmentalism will fade into a kind of Nazi style or, 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 or pagan style... Some, in which the idea that um, that humans do have a special is it Nazi or a pagan style? And now again, we're going to talk quite a bit more about that as as we get into the other clips that I'm going to play in this video. The status is is overturned, and in fact, nature, other species, they they come to seem more important, and and humanity is cast as a kind of plague, which is powerfully and fundamentally opposite to the Christian perspective. But it's it's kind of testimony to the enduring hold of Christianity and its assumptions on 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 people who live in the West that there's not much uptake for that. I mean, clearly there are people on the fringes of the Green Movement who do who do think that, but they they are seen as problematic. It would uh, but now in the 20th century, of course, which is where he's going to go, these things were pretty deeply challenged. Obviously, communism on one side challenged it very deeply and said, you know, religion is the opiate of the people. Religion must go. Um, the in in the Soviet Union, they worked very hard to systematically get rid of the church and religious ideas. A lot of that happened in China. That that was very much a part of the communist project. And even though that history 
there's not a lot of attention paid to that history. It's very clear. What's less clear often is the Nazis. And again, we're going to get into this. Enlightenment, Tom, given what you said earlier, to, to, to know, if you don't know already, that the Nazis were fanatically green. A lot of, yes. a lot of the idea Absolutely. Ideas. Yes, they were. And, and um, they were able to be, to, you know, their distinctive form of, of green was a very pagan and post-human one, post-humanist one. Yeah. Because, of course, the Nazis absolutely, um, at, at the heart of their philosophy, their sense of what was good, was a conscious repudiation of the two great moral fundamentals of Christianity. So again, now see, I played this next to Dillahunty's statement about, well, humanism is just basically a bald assumption that we're going to give human beings priority. Well, that this assumption has gone lots of different ways in lots of different places, and that's sort of where the 2 plus 2 equals 4, in terms of its self-evident character, doesn't really work here, because it's throughout human history even to many generations of Christians, it's not been self-evident that this, this, this priority should exact, should justify a cost to people who it will inconvenience and will have to suffer and pay for it. One that at the heart of their philosophy, their sense of what was good, was a conscious repudiation of the two great moral fundamentals of Christianity. One, that all human beings are created in the image of God, that they're all, you know, there's a, a fundamental uh, equality among humans. The Nazis say, no, not at all. Actually, there is Greek and Jew. You know, and the Jews are a lower form, and, 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 and we should have no compunction about getting rid of them, because their other thing that they reject is the idea... Now, notice, Jews are a lower form, and now... We're going to get into these details because actually this history is really very interesting and in, in how this plays out. That the weak have, or the, the oppressed or the tortured, have any claim on the strong. And they say, no, the strong should do what they like. And, and so in a sense, I think that's what's enabled. And, and again, the strong should do what they like. Read Plato's Republic. Read, read where that conversation goes about what is justice. In a sense, justice is people getting their due. And, and the due of the strong is their like. That's, that's essentially the, the position of the classical world. And that's part of the reason that in the process of writing this book, Tom Holland came to the conclusions that he expresses in this video. Christian morals and values to endure as effectively as it has, even though the habit of Christian worship and faith has faded, because uh, the West is, is haunted by a kind of subliminal understanding of what happens when Christianity goes, because we've seen it with the Nazis. We know what happens when you get rid of the idea that all humans are created in the image of God. And we know what happens when you get rid of the idea that the weak have a, have a kind of, um, have rights which they can claim against the strong, because we've seen it in, in the form of Nazism. So what's happened is that um, we no longer need the devil because we have Hitler. And we no longer need hell because we have Auschwitz. And we no longer need heretics because we have Nazis. And I think that, that that explains the readiness of people who are essentially promoting Christian values and assumptions without Christian belief to level the charge of Nazi at almost anyone who disagrees with them. That's very interesting. That is very interesting. Now, One of the things that's been brought up, again, I, I'd never really thought of this until I started, you know, listening to Peterson and his, um, his passionate um, call to remember what happened under communism. One of the, um, one of the things, this is by Kathy Young, she's, she's written a number of things on this, um, Cool Kid Communist Comeback. And she, she writes, uh, Teen Vogue, uh, Kami, um, Kami Chic is cool again. Teen Vogue, which now serves its beauty and lifestyle tips with a heavy dose of progressive politics, celebrated Karl Marx's 200th birthday in May with a feature lauding of the father of communism as bold and, and relevant, as a bold and relevant thinker. His writings have inspired social movements in the Soviet Russia, China, Cuba, Argentina, Ghana, Burkina Faso, we can mention Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, and more. The article noted coyly omitting any mention of how these social movements turned out. 
More recently, on a more highbrow note, the Boston Review gives us an essay exploring Jean-Paul Sartre's blend of existentialism and Marxism as a philosophy for our time, complete with a, a photo of Sartre and Simone de, Beauv de Beauvoir in a 1960, um, a 1960 conversation with Che Guevara. And, you know, women had better sex under socialism appeared. And in a, in a Gallup poll, a Gallup poll earlier this year found that among Democrats, Democratic leaning independence, and perhaps more significantly among all American adults under 30, socialism is now viewed with, with more, uh, more positively than capitalism. To some extent, this is a consequence of capitalism's falling stock. More than half of the respondents in both groups have reported a positive view of socialism since 2010. And on and on and on and on. Now, what's interesting is that, well, there's there's people kicking back. And a Google search, I didn't have to go very many deep to find how anti-communist propaganda worked. And I looked at this diagram first, and then I figured it out. Um... It's quite a little diagram, but you know, an an imagery fit here. And this this blog piece talks about well, this is how you can, this is how you can argue against anti-communist propaganda. The Black Book of Communism alleges that um, the Black Book of Communism alleges that communism killed 94 million people during the 20th century. This number is accumulated for more than 10 different nations and various movements around the world. It includes two of the most um, populous nations on earth, China and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union actually isn't that high in terms of popula population. Despite being cited, the Black Book of Communism often repeated been criticized for its reckless, careless, and highly questionable methodology. And it goes on to note... Um, it goes on to note that, well, here we're going to... If the allegations against communism is that it killed 100 million people, how many people did Nazism kill? Well, this is the other end of the spectrum, okay? The Holocaust death toll is estimated to be 15 million people to 20 million people. That's at least 1.25 million people killed each year. So in other words, the Nazis killed them faster. Oh, okay. Is that better? <laughs> Uh, compared to communism's alleged 1 million deaths among 10 different countries from various movements. I, this is, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if this is the kind of choice A or choice B we really want to make. If Nazism, Nazi kept pace at 1.25 million people killed each year, it is, it is, it would have reached 125 million deaths in a century compared to communism's alleged 100 million. Box A, 125. Box B, well, you might argue that maybe, you know, communism's a little more dangerous because it gets away killing for longer. The Nazis, you know, couldn't, couldn't last as, couldn't last as long. Uh, that's, that's one, that's one heck of an argument. And then it says, well, Nazis are responsible for World War II. And so then you have to add the people in World War II in 12 years. So there, the Nazis are worse. Okay. And again, I, I hope there are more options on the menu than Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union for us. One of the things that, that is interesting in this is also that not only does do Nazis sort of replace the devil, and racism has sort of become the new sin. Now, now, racism, for myself and many others, has always been a subset of sin, but, but in many ways what has happened is racism replaces sins. And I immediately thought of the marches in the civil rights movement and all of these individuals marking, marching with signs that say, I am a man, and thought, you couldn't get away with a sign like that today. Um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was, of course, a Christian minister. But it's interesting because what he did was leverage the writings of slaveholding Thomas Jefferson and the founding fathers in his very famous speech saying that what the, what the Declaration of Independence says, which is all men are created equal, is a promissory note that had been refused to be paid. And so what Dr. King actually did was look, in a sense, to these classical deists, some of which who were the founding fathers, and, and said, this is the standard that we must adhere to. 
Again, racism was a subset of sin, but now sin is considered to be archaic, and racism then becomes the only sin. And in many ways, the way religion works is that, that religions create value hierarchies and ideals and hold communities to those ideals because you gain status to the degree that you pursue these ideals, at least display that you're pursuing the ideals, and you lose status to the degree that you don't align with the ideals. So you lose status by being a, scape, by being a racist, and, and then you have the new scapegoat. Now, what is interesting to me about, before I started thinking about Nazis and learned about, you know, how are they connected with environmentalism, I was always just imagined that Nazis were wrong because they were racist. And, and that's not a bad thing, but it's fairly low resolution. And it wasn't until I started digging a little bit more that I began asking questions, well, Why? And there's a long, obviously a long history of anti-Semitism in Europe, Martin Luther, on and on. The standard story is that Nazis killed Jews because they were racist. And you heard this from Matt Dillahunty. They thought they were less than human. Um, you know, it's a, the, the, Nazis, the Nazis killed Jews because they weren't sufficiently egalitarian. And that is true. But I think it would serve us in this time when sin... Um, has been pushed aside and replaced simply by racism to ask deeper questions of racism, not just the degree to which racism penetrates societies and institutions, of which there's a great amount of thought and talk being done, but the question about what, what exactly is racism and where does it come from and, well, is there only one kind of racism? Does it only come from one source? Why is it so natural and prevalent among human beings? Well, so then I started doing some Google searches about Nazi, Nazi ideology and some YouTube searches because I make YouTube videos and so YouTube videos are easier to play. And I found a number of videos from a, a Holocaust art museum. I think it's in, I think it's in the state of Israel. And, well, let's... In November 1923, at a time when the economic crisis in the Republic had reached a peak with extreme unemployment and unprecedented hyperinflation, Hitler and his fellow party members attempted to seize control of Germany, beginning with the takeover of the Bavarian government in Munich. The armed revolt, known as the Beer Hall Putsch, failed. Caught and tried for treason, Hitler was sentenced to five years in jail, though he only served nine months. That's quite interesting. And he says a little more about that. During this time, he was imprisoned in very comfortable conditions. He had a private room in which he received his many guests, got regular deliveries of newspapers and books, and was surrounded by his personal assistant and friends. Mo <laughs> Not exactly hard time. Most of his time in prison was dedicated to the composing of Mein Kampf, My Struggle. His political autobiography in which he outlined his vision for a new future for Germany and the main principles of Nazi ideology or worldview. These continued to be formulated in the following years by Hitler himself and by other central figures in the Nazi party. What then were the main principles of the Nazi ideology? Nazi ideology was a worldview that claimed to explain everything about the world and how it functions. Now, if you haven't watched um John Verveke's episode on the crash, where he, you know, he talks about with the with the loss of these religions, people grab at ideologies. There's romanticism, there's communism, there's there's these Nazi ideologies. People grab at these ideologies because you need something to make sense for your life. Because, well, we that, that, that's simply necessary for human beings to, the story, the story verse has to be filled with the story that makes sense of everything down beneath it. It has to make sense of all the data that comes into our minds. And so in the 20th century, as, as Christianity in, in many ways continued to wane, ideologies rushed into the, rushed into the game and these other stories began to began to possess people. But now listen carefully. This is obviously an, an expert, senior historian in the International Institute for Holocaust Research at, at this, at this um, 
at this museum, editor-in-chief of their studies. And so I thought, well, I've got to get the straight dope from this guy. Now, it's a short video, and I, well, let's just listen to it. At its core, the ideology was racial and biological. Okay, racial. I already knew that. They're racist. Okay, and biological. Well, that's interesting. Totalitarian and imperialistic. Totalitarian and imperialistic. Yeah, I sort of get that part. But it's the racism and the biological. Okay, so they're making biological claims on racism. Well, that's not that's not too hard to think about if you know anything about the latter part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century. Nazi ideology viewed the world as divided into races with superior and inferior races. And of course, the Aryan race, the so-called Aryan race, was the superior race to which the Nazis attributed all positive developments in humanity. Okay, so, so and we're going to dive into this quite a bit more deeply. So there's all these different races, and the Nazis are on top, and you know they're, they know they're on top because they, it's, it's important to understand, and there's some good YouTube videos on this out there, the, the rise, you know, when Germany became a nation under Bismarck. And if you look at, actually, the, the Eric Weinstein, um, an Eric, his first podcast, you know, he talked about this. You know, Germany, Germany in the 20th century, until it's in the first half of the 20th century, was a superpower. They had the best scientists. They had the most education. They were, in many ways, they, they didn't have the natural resources, which, again, if you read Black Earth, and we're going to talk more about Timothy Snyder, they didn't have the natural resources, but they had everything that it took to be the preeminent nation in the world. They, you know, they were sort of competing. They were rivals to England. That would that would be, you know, one of the other competitors towards that. France had in some ways slipped behind. But, you know, France, Germany, England, Germany, Germany could easily make claims to being the most powerful, the 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 nation with the best scientists, the nation with the best ideas. They were supreme, and of course, they saw this as validation for their ideas about race. Now, if you throw the Jews in there, now suddenly things are going to be funny because a lot of these people who are doing amazing things, again, read the book The Alchemy of Air. A lot of these people doing these amazing things in Germany are Jews. So, where do they fit in? And in fact, looking at how many Nobel Prize they've prizes they've won, if someone's going to think, somebody's going to think in these terms, the Jews, even though, well, until you know, 1948, they didn't have their own nation state. The Jews, as a people, could very much have had a claim to the top spot. And so the question is, well, what do you do with the Jews? in arts, in science, in... Uh... And, 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 you know, as Matt Dillahunty said, you know, well, they thought Jews were inferior. Not really. They, they thought, well, we'll let them talk. In technology and so on. And all the other races of humanity fit into the hi racial hierarchy in various rungs beneath the so-called Aryan race. For example, the Latin race, the French, the Italians, and so on. Now, it's very interesting here how in this Nazi ideology, you have Germans are a race, Italians are a race, the French are a race, the English are a race. Today, of course, they're all white. So it's like, well, that's kind of interesting. And, and so then you have to ask questions about, well, well, what did you mean by race? After the Second World War, there's a lot of discussion about nationalism and what are the problems of nationalism because, of course, Germany and Italy are late to the game in terms of forming as, as nation states. And actually, Tim Snyder has some very interesting videos on YouTube about the post-war period and the, and the decline at the end of the First World War was the end of the land empires in Europe. At the end of the Second World War was the demise of the maritime empires in Europe. But it's very interesting how at this point they're conceiving race. We're one rung below the Aryan race who could appreciate culture but do not create culture. Let's listen to that again. Fit into the racial hierarchy in various rungs beneath 
the so-called Aryan race. For example, the Latin race, the French, the Italians, and so on, were one rung below the Aryan race, who could appreciate culture, but do not create culture and the arts and science and so on. Within this view, the Jews were viewed as a kind of anti-race, an inhuman race of some sort, a creature of some sort that existed in human form. That's very interesting. Because again, go back, I, this is something that I, I didn't fully appreciate until I did a little bit of digging. Because again, if, if you're stacking people up according to their accomplishments, I can understand why the Nazis stacked the Germans way up to the top because, again, at the beginning of the 20th century, Germany was a preeminent nation. The United States did not have, the, the United States was a land of tremendous potential and considerable accomplishment, but Germany very much had a claim to the top. But the Jews were sort of a race. And now what do you do with the Jews in this schema and all of their, well, you kind of make them a, they're a non-race. Now, to get at this, again, I when I was I, I just finished Black Earth, and it's a very interesting book. And if you if you read all the way through it, and you get to the last chapter, you can see uh, Carl made a few comments in the in when I mentioned this book before. And Timothy Snyder has his own axes to grind with respect to theories of state and and a number of other issues that he displays in the book, but. One of, the, one of the best chapters of the book is, in fact, the, the introduction in the book. Let's see if I've got it here. Oh, I don't have it up. Okay, so I want, to read some of, I want to read some of this introduction here. Nothing could be known about the future, thought Hitler, except the limits of our planet. That was key for him. The surface area of a, of a precisely measured space. Ecology was scarcity. And existence meant a struggle for land. Listen to listen to Brett Weinstein's. He has an earlier talk about you know humanity in terms of open spaces and and some of these things. Some of that stuff relates to the beginning here and and Hitler's view of the world. The immutable structure of life was the division of animals into species, commended to inner seclusion and an endless fight to the death. Human races, Hitler was convinced, were like species. The highest races were still evolving from the lower, which meant that interbreeding was possible but sinful. Now, now remember, we're going to get into this question of, well, did Hitler have a religion? Yeah, he did. He had, a, he did very much had an idea of sin. But where did, where did Hitler's assumptions come from? Races should behave like species, like mating with like and and seeking to um, kill unlike. You know, lions eat goats. This for Hitler was a law, the law of racial struggle as certain as the law of gravity. The struggle could never end and it had no certain outcome. A race could triumph and flourish and could also be starved and extinguished. The Neanderthals are gone. Um, all, these, all these homo habilis and all those, those guys are gone. Um, they're replaced by us. In Hitler's world, the law of the jungle was the only law. Now, now again, Snyder has a lot going on with respect to state here that, that you can agree with or not agree with, but um, that's, that's a big issue of, of Snyder's thesis in this book. People were to suppress any inclination to be merciful and to be as rapacious as they could. Now, you've got a reading of Nietzsche below this, obviously. This is an ought. This is the ought they get from the is of nature and the patterns in nature. Hitler thus broke with the traditions of political thought that presented human beings as distinct from nature in their capacity to imagine and create new forms of association. So, in other words, all of these ideas about new forms of association and all of this creativity that we tend to do in the world of the mind, all of this is, well, this is where it gets very interesting because all this is sort of an illusion. All the stuff down here of natural, this is reality. Up here is illusion. Now, there's some huge inconsistencies, which he gets later on in this introduction that probably won't get that far in terms of reading it. But this is, this is really critical for understanding Hitler and Hitler's world. 
Beginning, beginning from that assumption, political thinkers tried to describe not only the possible, but the most and just, the most just forms of society. Okay, so what is justice? Well, again, read the beginning of, of Plato's Republic, at least the starting point of that conversation was started with Socrates. It's the just getting what they deserve. Well, what do the just deserve? What do the strong deserve? The, the strong deserve the biggest portion. That's what the strong deserve. And if, you, and if you're skeptical about that or don't know where that comes from, just look at nature. I used to have two Rottweilers, a, a male and a female. They were siblings. And the bigger dog was Macho and his sister was Mocha. And Macho always ate first. And Mocha ate what was left over. So I had to feed him separately if I wanted the other dog to get enough. For Hitler, however, nature was the singular, brutal, and overwhelming truth, and the whole history of attempting to think otherwise was an illusion. Carl Schmitt, a leading Nazi legal theorist, explained that politics arose not from history or from concepts, but from our sense of enmity. Our racial enemies were chosen by nature, and our task was to struggle and kill and die. Nature knows, wrote Hitler, no boundary, no political boundaries. She places life forms on this globe and then sets them to then sets them free in a play for power. Since politics was nature and nature was struggle, no political thought was possible. This conclusion was extreme. This ex, this conclusion was an extreme articulation of the 19th century. Common um, was an extreme articulation of the 19th century commonplace that human activities could be understood as biology. In the 1880s and 1890s, serious thinkers and popularizers influenced by Charles Darwin's ideas of natural selection proposed that the ancient questions of political thought had been resolved by its breakthrough in zoology. When Hitler was young, an interpretation of Darwin in which competition was identified as a social good influenced all major forms of politics. For Herbert Spencer, the British defender of capitalism, a market was like an ecosystem where the strongest and the best survived. The utility brought by the un, um, the utility brought by unhindered competition justified its immediate evils. The opponents of capitalism, the socialists of the second inter, of the second international, also embraced biological analogies. They came to see the class struggle as scientific. Notice how they're both feeding from the same dish here. And man was one animal among many. Instead of a, instead of a specially creative being with a specifically human essence. Karl Kautsky, Kautsky, the leading Marxist theorist of the day, insisted pedantically that people were animals. Yet these liberals and socialists were constrained. Whether they realized it or not, by attachment to custom and institution, mental habits that grew from social experiments hindered them from reaching the most radical conclusions. They were ethically committed to goods, such as economic growth or social justice, and found it appealing or convenient to imagine that natural competition would deliver these goods. Hitler entitled his book Mein Kampf, My Struggle. For those two words, through two long volumes and two decades of political life, he was endlessly narcissistic, pitilessly consistent, and exuberantly nihilistic where others were not. The ceaseless strife of races was not an element of nature, but its essence. The ceaseless, the ceaseless strife of races was not an element of life, but its essence. To say so was not to build a theory, but to observe the universe as it is. Struggle was life, not meant to some, not, not a means to some other end like the glory of God or human happiness. Struggle was life. That's what life is. It was not justified by the prosperity, capitalism, or justice, socialism, that, supposedly, that it supposedly brought. Hitler's point was not at all that the desirable end justified the bloody means. There was no end, only meanness. Race was real whereas individuals and classes were fleeting and erroneous constructions. 
Struggle was not a metaphor or an analogy, but a tangible and total truth. The weak were to be dominated by the strong, since the world is not there for the cowardly peoples, end quote. That was, what, that was all that there was to be known and believed. Hitler's worldview dismissed religious and secular traditions and yet relied upon both. There's some real inconsistencies in, in Hitler's worldview. Though he was no original thinker, he supplied a certain resolution to a crisis of both thought and faith. Like many before him, he sought to bring the two together. What he meant to engineer, however, was not an elevated synthesis that would rescue both soul and mind, but a seductive collision that destroyed both. Okay, so mind is actually the enemy. Now, nature, matter is foundational, mind is derivative, mind, therefore, can also be illusory and an impediment to what nature simply is. Hitler's racial struggle was supposed to was supposedly sanctioned by science, but he called its object daily bread. Notice the religious words he's using. With these words, he was summoned one of the best known Christian texts while profoundly altering its meaning. Give us this day, as those who recite the Lord's Prayer, our daily bread. In the universe, the prayer describes there is a metaf there is a metaphysics an order beyond this planet notions of good that proceed from one sphere to another that proceed from one sphere to another those saying the lord's prayer ask god forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil in hitler's struggle for the riches of nature it was a sin not to seize everything possible and a crime to allow others to survive Notice, that's a crime, that's a sin, that's wrong, that's bad to let others survive. Why? Because good demands it. Well, how do we know the good? We see it in nature. Mercy violates the order of things because it allowed the weak to propagate. Rejecting the biblical commandments, said Hitler, it was, it was what human beings must do. If I can achieve a divine commandment, he wrote, it is, it's this one. Thou shalt preserve the species. Hitler exploited images and tropes that were familiar to Christians. God, prayer, original sins, commandments, prophets, chosen people, messiahs, and even, even the familiar Christian tripartite structure of time. First paradise, then exodus, and finally redemption. We live in filth, and we must strain to purify ourselves and the world so that we might return to paradise to see paradise as the battle of the species rather than the concord of creation was to unite Christian longing with the apparent realism of biology. The war of all against all was not terrifyingly purposeless, but instead the only purpose to be had in the universe. That's the ought they're getting from the is, the most basic observation from nature. Nature's bounty was for man as in Genesis, but only for men who follow nature's laws and fight for her. Here's your radical environmentalism. As in Genesis, so in my struggle, nature was the resource, was a resource for man, but not for all people, only for triumphant races. Eden was not a garden, but a trench. Knowledge of the body was not the problem, as in Genesis, but the solution. The triumphant should copulate. After murder, Hitler thought, the next human duty was sex and reproduction. Ironic for a man who didn't have children. In this scheme, the original sin that led to the fall of man was of the mind and the soul, not the body. For Hitler, our unhappy weakness was that we can think. But this sounds very familiar to a lot of other things you hear, doesn't it? Our unhappy weakness is that we can think, realize that others belong to other races can do the same, and thereby recognize them as fellow human beings. That's the problem. That's the sin. Humans left Hitler's bloody paradise not because of, a carnal, because of carnal knowledge. Humans left paradise because of the knowledge of good and evil. When paradise falls and humans are separated from nature, a character who is neither human nor natural such as the serpent of Genesis, takes the blame. 
If humans were in fact nothing more than an element of nature and nature was known by science to be a bloody struggle, something beyond nature must have corrupted the species. For Hitler, the bringer of the knowledge of good and evil on earth, the destroyer of Eden, was the Jew. Ah, now we can better understand. If you read Snyder's other book, Bloodlands, it, it, he goes into detail how this, this drive to destroy the Jews and other well, the Jews, again, are not necessarily an inferior race. They're a, kind of an other thing. They're, they're, in a sense, these these demons that are corrupting the race from doing what they need to do. They're a contagion. Okay? And I never really understood that until I read this introduction, this chapter on, on Hitler's world. And now, suddenly, a lot of the data that we find about Hitler's decisions. I mean, I used to think, well, this is just blind hatred or racism. No. There's a an imagined moral structure here that is rooted in the science of the day. It's rooted in what is self-evident of the day. You know, what could be what could be less self-evident than than differences between human beings? It was the Jew who told humans that they were above all other animals and had the capacity to decide their future for themselves. Look at those two ideas. Think about how those two ideas are bouncing around society today. It was the Jew who introduced the false distinction between politics and nature, between humanity and struggle. Hitler's destiny, as he saw it, was to redeem the original sin of Jewish spirituality and restore the paradise of blood. Since Homo sapiens can survive only by unrestrained racial killing, a Jewish triumph of reason over impulse would mean the end of the species. What a race needed, thought Hitler, was a worldview that permitted it to triumph, which meant in the final analysis, faith in its own mindless mission. And, and that word mindless there isn't accidental. We need to stop thinking and start, well, killing and reproducing and dominating. Hitler's presentation of the Jewish threat revealed its particular amalgamation of religious and zoological ideas. If the Jew triumphs, Hitler wrote, then the crown victory will be the funeral wreath of the human species. On the other hand, Hitler's image of a universe without human beings accepted science's verdict of an ancient planet on which humanity had evolved. After the Jewish victory, he wrote, Earth will once again wing its way through the universe entirely without humans, as was the case millions of years ago. At the same time, he made clear in the very passage of my struggle, this ancient earth of races and extermination was the creation of God. Therefore, I believe myself to be acting according to the wishes of the creator. Insofar as I restrain the Jew, I am defending the work of the Lord. Hitler saw the species as divided into races, but denied that the Jews were one. That's how you get rid of the Nobel problem with the Jews. You can't have them on top of the Germans. They wanted them distinct from the Germans, but, well, they're not even a race. Jews were not a lower or a higher race, but a non-race or a counter-race. Races followed nature and fought for land and food, whereas Jews followed the alien logic of unnature. They were unnatural. They were non-natural. They resisted nature's basic imperative by refusing to be justified by the conquest of a certain habitat, and they, pers and they persuaded others to behave similarly. They insisted on dominating the entire planet and its peoples. A little bit later in the book, you'll read that, you know, Madagascar, we're going to send all the Jews to Madagascar. And lots of other people in Europe had this idea, and there's this always, we got to get the Jews a homeland. They need a place because they're just spread all about, and they're taking over wherever they go. And, and Hitler will believe that communism, his great enemy, 
communism, well, there that's a Jewish conspiracy. And so had to get rid of communism. It's why he attacks Russia even after he had you know basically won the war in the West. They insisted on dominating the entire planet and its peoples, and for this purpose invented general ideas that draw the races away from their natural struggle. The planet had nothing to offer except blood and soil, and yet Jews uncannily generated concepts that allowed the world to be seen as an ecological trap and more as human order. Ideas of political reciprocity, practices in which humans recognize other human beings as such, came from Jews. Hitler's basic critique was not the usual one that human beings were good, but had been corrupted by an overly Jewish civilization. It was rather that humans were animals and that any exercise of ethical deliberation was in itself a sign of Jewish corruption. The very attempt to set a universal ideal and strain towards it, religion in other ways, and, um, was precisely what was hateful. Heinrich Himmler, Hitler's most important deputy, did not follow every twist of Hitler's thinking, but he grasped the conclusions. Ethics as such was an error. The only morality was fidelity to race. Participation in mass murder, Himmler maintained, was a good act, since it brought to the race an internal harmony as well as unity with nature. The difficulty of seeing, for example, thousands of Jewish corpses marked by transcendence of conventional, um, um, marked the transcendence of conventional morality. The temporary strains of murder were worthy sacrifices to a future race. Any non-racist attitude was Jewish, thought Hitler. And any universal idea, a mechanism of Jewish domination. Both capitalism and communism were Jewish. Their apparent embrace of struggle was simply cover for the Jewish desire for world domination. Any abstract idea of the state was also Jewish. There's no such thing, wrote Hitler, as the state as an end in itself. He clarified the highest goals of human being was not the preservation of any given state or government, but the preservation of their kind. The frontiers of every existing state could be washed away by the forces of nature in the course of racial struggle. One must not be diverted from the borders of eternal right by the existence of political borders. If states were not... Now, states are obviously a very big thing for, um, for this book. But I think that, that I found that tremendously helpful in terms of understanding what exactly, again, we just say, well, he's racist. Well, this racist thing doesn't begin to understand the conceptualization that actually moved and mobilized one of the greatest nations in the world to, as Winston Churchill said, commit a sin which has no name. Now, as I was Googling around and looking for resources on Nazi ideology, I came across Rich, Richard Weichart. Now, this is very interesting because he works for the Discovery Institute. And put on another hat, Discovery Institute is all about intelligent design. And so now, see, I wanted to make this clear in the video because just saying that, some of you won't listen to him because of their ideas about human evolution. But right away, his books and his videos came up, and, well, now, this is part of the reason I'm using multiple sources. Now, one of the things that I think the IDW has been lacking in has been historians, and this is where I think the work of Tom Holland comes in. Now, Weichart might very well have some religious views that some of you find distasteful, and some views about some other things that some of you find distasteful, just like Timothy Snyder has views that some of you will find distasteful. Well, what you do with historians is a good historian will obviously have their biases and their agendas and the points that they're trying to make, but look at the resources, the primary resources that they cite, watch their use of secondary resources and see how they put this thing together. Now he's got, now Richard has quite a few interesting videos out on, on YouTube about this, and I want to play a couple clips from one of them. He's a professor at, um, fix. He's a professor at the, uh, I don't think it's listed here, um, uh, Stanislav County, a little bit further south in the Central Valley here in California. He's a professor of history, and I've you know started reading one of his books, 
seems to be quite a good historian, which is why he's a professional historian. A second point that I want to make before I get going is that I, when I began my research, I didn't begin trying to link Darwin with Hitler. I did my dissertation on the uh, impact of so Darwinism on German socialists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And as I was doing that, I began, became interested in evolutionary ethics because I noticed that a lot of these German thinkers were writing about ethics and trying to set up and trying to promote some kind of evolutionary ethic. In other words, the ideas of Hitler, again, when we think, oh, racism, these are just hateful people doing hateful things. Now, that's, that's way too simplistic. Uh, when I first started this research, I wasn't even thinking about Hitler. In fact, and I was a little wary of that because there's a book by a, a scholar named Daniel Gassman who's not taken very seriously by most uh, historians who does try to draw a very direct line from Ernst Haeckel, who was the leading German Darwinist, to Hitler. Uh, and he does it in ways that don't really make a lot of sense. And I agree with a lot of the criticisms that have been leveled at him. So I was a little wary of making that kind of connection. Nonetheless, I obviously did make the connection, uh, ultimately. <clears throat> Uh, and I believe it was a case of being driven there by the uh, empirical data that turned up uh, time and again and brought me to the point where I uh, made the connections, but I think in a much more subtle and uh, more uh, truthful way, perhaps, than Daniel Gassman uh, had. There were two reasons that I made this sort of unexpected turn in my research. First of all, as I began studying evolutionary ethics in late 19th century Germany, I started finding out that German eugenicists were in the forefront of talking about evolutionary ethics. Uh, and I hadn't realized that uh, until getting underway with my research somewhat. And so I better say just a little bit about eugenics because that's one of the Cal State, California State University Stanislaus County themes in my book. Uh, and uh, it has a big bearing then on uh, what I'm going to have to say here. Francis Galton, here's a biography uh, of him is considered the founding father of eugenics. Eugenics was a movement that was very prominent in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to try to improve human heredity. Uh, Galton got that idea, by the way, in part from reading Darwin's Origin of Species by his own admission. Darwin was his cousin uh, and <clears throat> He imbibed Darwinian ideas. And in fact, all of the German eugenicists likewise argued very strongly that their uh, ideology was based upon Darwinism. In fact, there was a fear among many of these eugenicists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that because modern culture, especially modern medicine, was uh, undermining natural selection by allowing the, quote, unfit, to survive and reproduce, that this was producing something of a problem. And so the way to get around the problem of the deterioration or degeneration, as the term was used quite often in the late 19th, early 20th century, the way to get around that problem of degeneration was to use artificial selection. And so this is then what eugenics was all about, trying to use some way of artificially selecting uh, humans uh, to produce, to get away from degeneration and hopefully also to then uh, improve the human species and to direct human evolution. So this is one reason then, the issue of eugenics that began driving me in the direction of my research. The second issue was in 1995 I offered a seminar called Darwinism, Religion, and Society. And in that seminar we discussed a book by James Rachels. And that book was called Created from Animals, The Moral Implications of Evolution. As we began discussing this book in the seminar, Two very bright students in that seminar uh, said that they believe that Darwinism proved moral relativism. Well, that caught my attention, and so I decided to give them a sort of concrete example to see how far they were willing to drive that, and I said, so, okay, what about Hitler? Was, what about Hitler? Was he evil? Hitler is the devil. That's, that's who we can point to. Evil? Was he, uh, you know, what, what would you say about him? And without batting an eye, they said, Correct. He was neither good nor evil. You know, they wanted to drive the moral relativism as far as it would go. Uh, I was rather horrified by that, of course. Uh, so that got me thinking in certain ways about Darwinism and moral relativism. Then the second thing uh, about Rachel's book is that Rachel's whole argument is that Darwinism undermines 
the Judeo-Christian concept of the sanctity of human life. And so that got me thinking about some of these uh, German Darwinists that I'd read about uh, who had, some of them had, had similar kinds of ideas. And for example, one of them that I already knew about at this point was Ernst Haeckel, who was the leading Darwinist in Germany in the late 19th century and on into the early 20th century. Uh, and Haeckel had in, already in 1870 proposed infanticide for those with congenital illnesses, especially mental illnesses. So I moved back into my research with this question then, does Darwinism devalue human life, or at least do Darwinists think that Darwinism devalues human life? And I so started investigating then these uh, Darwinist thinkers using that question. And that question is very controversial. Does Darwinism uh, devalue human life? There are many Darwinists who will say that Darwinism doesn't have anything to do with ethics or morality. They'll invoke what's called the naturalistic fallacy, which states that you can't get from is to ought. <clears throat> and they will call uh, Hitler's invocation of Darwinism, they'll sometimes call it vulgar Darwinism or distorted Darwinism. I've heard those uh, various terms. However, whatever the philosophical argument one wants to make about that, the plain fact of the matter is historically that many leading Darwinists did and still do today uh, believe that Darwinism does have strong ethical implications. Darwin himself did, by the way. Uh, and there were actually many of them who expressed positions very close to Rachel's own position. And so my research then sort of underlines this train of thought and the implications, or rather the uh, consequences, that it had. Now, I want to talk then about what some of these implications are. And when I say this, the implications of Darwinism for devalue of human life, this is not just my own philosophical spin. I'm giving you what Darwinists themselves are saying about Darwinism. Now again, not all Darwinists are going to agree with this, I acknowledge that. But nonetheless, there are many Darwinists uh, who do uh, buy into these particular ideas that I'm going to uh, put forward to you uh, tonight. First of all, human inequality. Evolution requires variation. There has to be biological variation for evolution to occur. And many <clears throat> scientists... Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump forward. I mean, you, can, you can listen to this. I want to pick another thing. Pick another point later in the video. Now, I think what this has to do with Hitler is probably fairly obvious. I don't need to spend a lot of time on it. If you want to read more about it, the last chapter of my book talks about Hitler and his ideas. In fact, the last chapter is called Hitler's Ethic, which is not an oxymoron, by the way. A lot of people think that, that does, that's sort of contradictory, Hitler's Ethic. In fact, I actually gave a talk one time at a university where I, was, I, I laid out the table of contents for my book. And the last chapter on Hitler's Ethic, one, one of the uh, persons in the audience in question and answer time quipped and said, well, I guess that last uh, chapter is going to be kind of thin, huh? <laughs> and I said, oh, on the contrary, I think Hitler did have some very coherent, albeit pernicious, uh, moral views. And in fact, uh, very interestingly, the very day that I sent my manuscript off to the, my publisher, the very final manuscript last July, I received an email from someone telling me about a work uh, by Claudia Kuntz at Duke University with Harvard University Press that just came out called The Nazi Conscience. Uh, and her work, in fact, corroborates a lot of what I say about Hitler and his particular views, at least that he has a coherent ethic. She doesn't argue for the Darwinian uh, angle, uh, however. She doesn't really talk about the antecedents at all. So my work actually fits uh, together kind of nicely with hers, uh, in fact. But I think what it has to do with Nazis is pretty obvious. But here's a Nazi poster uh, to sort of make a little more explicit here what we're talking about. This Nazi poster sounds a lot like uh, the one I showed you earlier with the American eugenics uh, society at the fairs and such. 60,000 marks is what this mentally ill person costs the national community in a lifetime. Comrades, this is your money too. And uh, once uh, the Nazis came to power in uh, July 1933, just six months after they came to power, they passed a law of compulsory sterilization for those who were considered mentally or physically handicapped, especially those who were institutionalized. Uh, and they uh, carried this program on extremely vigorously, sterilizing several hundred thousand. In fact, they sterilized half the population. Uh, excuse me, half a percent of the population of difference. Germany was sterile, compulsorily sterilized in their sterilization program. 
Then when World War II broke out, they began a so-called euthanasia program. Now, but this was not voluntary euthanasia. This was the murder of the mentally and physically handicapped who were institutionalized, which began in October 1939 and was carried out in six uh, killing centers located throughout Germany in which they killed about 70,000 mentally and physically, mostly mentally, but also some physically handicapped uh, people. Uh, and this is considered by many scholars the uh, first step of the Holocaust. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a, a book called The Origins of the Nazi Holocaust uh, by uh, Henry Friedlander in which he argues that the euthanasia campaign was the opening salvo in uh, the Nazi Holocaust. <clears throat> There was a close connection between these eugenics ideas and his racial ideas. The inequality was simply on a different level there. But you might ask then, okay, you know, these ideas were around in the late 19th, early... And then he'll go on from there. I also wanted to pull up his book, Hitler's Religion, because, again, doing a deeper dive into, well, what was, what was actually behind this? And, and again, you'll hear... Um, you'll hear people say, well, Hitler was a Christian, or Hitler was a pagan. Um, well, what exactly were Hitler's religious beliefs like? The debate over Hitler's religion is not a sterile academic controversy over the musty past, but a dispute that still, ar still arouses deep and intense passions. When Maurizio Catalan's sculpture of him was placed in the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial in December 9, in 2012, it provoked considerable contention and even ire. In the exhibit, only the back of a kneeling supplicant is visible. In earlier displays of, of him, that's what the, the piece is called, at art galleries around the world, visitors usually approached the figure, um, the figure from the back and received a jolt when they walked around the front and recognized the face, a youthful rendition of Adolf Hitler. According to the notes accompanying one of the exhibits of him, the dictator is represented in the act of pleading for forgiveness. The Simon Wiesenthal, Wiesenthal Center, a Jewish, um, Jewish organization, roundly criticized the statue's display at the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial as a senseless provocation which insults the memory of, Jewish, of Nazis' Jewish victims. When I first saw the photo of the sculpture, my gut reaction was negative too. But the more I pondered it, the more I thought the sculpture might be imparting to us an important reminder. Evil often appears in the guise of piety. It is hard for me to imagine Hitler kneeling in prayer, except perhaps during his childhood, and I rather doubt he ever indulged in such a spiritual exercise as an adult. There is certainly no evidence he ever sought forgiveness from God, for he was convinced to the end of his life that he was obeying his God. However, in his unreliable memoir, Mein Kampf, Hitler claims he did kneel in prayer at least on one occasion, when World War I broke out. He wrote, Overpowered by stormy enthusiasm, I fell down on my knees and thanked heaven from an overflowing heart for granting me the good fortune of being permitted to live at this time. Huh. Lucky for him, he gets to fight in World War I. After Hitler came to power, he enjoined his fellow Germans in a 1936 speech, let us fall down upon our knees and beg the Almighty to grant us strength to prevail in the struggle for freedom and the future and the honor and the peace of our Volk. So help us God. Volk, a German term, is difficult to translate. It means people in the sense of an ethnic group and sometimes translated as nation, but this is not entirely satisfactory because by the early 20th century, it often had racial overtones. So much for Volkswagen. Hitler, in, Hitler intentionally cultivated an image of piety and righteousness that served him well in his climb to power and in maintaining popularity after achieving power. He wanted people to see him as kneeling as a kneeling devout supplicant. Some people still believe in the image of Hitler the pious and use it as a weapon against religion, while others recoil in horror at the thought that Hitler could have been religious. In one of the most famous one of the most famous atheists in the world, Richard Dawkins crossed swords intellectually intellectually with Pope Benedict the Sixteenth over the religious identity of, of Hitler and Nazism. On his papal visit to Britain in September 2010, Benedict harshly criticized atheism and secularism while lauding Britain for having fought against a Nazi tyranny that wished to eradicate God from society. Dawkins was livid. In his article, Ratzinger, 
i.e. Benedict is the enemy of humanity, Dawkins reminded readers that Benedict was a former member of Hitler Youth. Thus Dawkins maintained Benedict should be more circumspect. Dawkins insisted that Hitler was not an atheist but a Catholic who sincerely believed in God. He even quoted a 1922 speech where Hitler called himself a Christian and referred to Jesus as my Lord and Savior. This quotation is a favorite of atheists, appearing in dozens of atheist and secularist websites. This controversy over Hitler's religion, as well as over the relationship between religion and Nazism in general, has raged since Hitler emerged as a significant political figure in Munich in the early 1920s. Otto Strausser, a leader in the early Nazi movement who broke away from Hitler in 1930, told his brother in the late 20s why he was increasingly dissatisfied with Hitler. We are Christians. Without Christianity, Europe is lost. Hitler is an atheist. Despite the fact that Hitler never renounced his membership in the Catholic Church before he seized power in 1933, and about two years thereafter, the Catholic hierarchy forbade Catholics from joining the Nazi party because they viewed Hitler's movement as fundamentally hostile to their faith. In 1937, Pope Pius XI condemned the Nazi regime not only for persecuting the Catholic Church and harassing its clergy, clergy but also for teaching ideology that conflicted with Catholic doctrines goes on quite a bit like this um, I'll just I'm just gonna read certain sections and yet Hitler was incredibly popular during the Third Reich almost to the very end most Germans who voted for Hitler or joined his party considered themselves good Christians and many of them hailed Hitler as a protector of Christianity from the godless communists some Protestant pastors and Catholic priests joined the Nazi party and cheered Hitler on, and some intentionally respected Protestant theologians, some in, in, internationally respected Protestant theologians climbed towards the Nazi juggernaut, too. By the mid-1930s, about 600,000 German Protestants had joined the German church, the German Christian movement, which synthesized Nazi ideology and liberal Protestant theology. In 1933, Hitler publicly promoted the German Christian candidates in the Protestant Church election, giving encouragement to those who hoped for an amalgamation of Christianity and Nazism. The conflicting views of Hitler as atheist or Hitler as devout Christian are further complicated by the widespread view of Hitler as a disciple of the occult. Hitler's evil was so intense and inexplicable that some suspect that he must have had supernatural connections with the underworld that enabled him to sway the masses and rise to power in Germany. Myriads of books and films purport to prove Hitler as a follower of black arts. So what was Hitler? An atheist, a Christian, or an occultist? I demonstrate in the following pages that he was none of these. He was not an atheist because he sincerely believed in the existence of God. He was not a Christian because the God he believed in was not Jesus Christ or the God of the Christian Bible. He was not an occultist because he overtly rejected occultist beliefs and mystical practices. What then was his religion? After carefully sifting through Hitler's writings, speeches, and testimonies of his associates, as well as other historians' interpretations of Hitler, I have concluded that Hitler's religion was pantheism. This is interesting. Or, if not pantheism, at least close to it. Now, given what we read from Timothy Snyder, this makes a lot of sense. He believed that nature, or the entire cosmos, was God. My interpretation will come not as a complete shock to scholars, since I am by no means the first historian to suggest that Hitler was a pantheist. However, there is still disagreement among scholars on the topic, and certainly the public remains divided on this issue. This book offers, clar um, offers to clarify the debate through, uh, through its detailed, sustained analysis of Hitler's religion, indeed the most extensive to date in the English language. At first glance, it might seem that Hitler's pantheistic worship of nature is, is incidental, a bit of trivia that does little or nothing to help us understand the man and the atrocities that he committed. But to suppose this would be to make a mistake. Hitler's devotion to nature as a divine being had a grim corollary. The laws of nature became his infallible guide to morality. Whatever conformed to the laws of nature was morally good, and whatever contravened nature and its ways was evil. When Hitler explained how he hoped to harmonize human society with the scientific laws of nature, he emphasized principles derived from Darwinian theory. 
especially the racist forms of Darwinianism prominent among Darwin's German disciples. These laws included human biological inequality, especially racial inequality, and the human struggle for existence and natural selection. In the Darwinian struggle for existence, multitudes perish and only a few of the fittest individuals survive and reproduce. If this is nature's way, Hitler thought, then he should emulate nature by destroying those destined for death. Thus, in his twisted vision of religion, Hitler believed that he was serving his God by annihilating the allegedly inferior humans and promoting the welfare and prolific reproduction of the supposedly superior Aryans. Uh, the whole chapter is, is quite interesting. I'll, um, I'll leave it at that, and those of you who want to follow up on the book certainly can. I've I found the um, a book so far very, very interesting. Now, I'm, I've decided to... Let me take these off. I've decided to split this up into two parts. And the reason is because it's just so darn long. And I have various other reasons for this. So I'm going to release one part, and then a few days later I'll re release the second part. What I did in the first part is I, I posed the question, do we, do we have reason to believe that secular humanism is more fragile than Christianity? And we took a fairly deep dive into Nazism and and Hitler's faith. Now, in all fairness, the church did not resist Hitler well. There were elements of the church, the confessing church, but, but many Germans were able to sort of piece together their Christianity and their Nazism, and, and that is a huge problem. So I don't want to pose the question imagining that, well, Christianity just always stands and, and never fails. Well, that's, that's not true. Christianity in the East, for example, with the, the rise of Islam, and that's another thing, I, want, I have too many things I want to study. Um, you know, Christianity was eaten by Islam to a significant degree. Um, Christianity endured communism in the Soviet Union and and you know managed to to stay alive through that christianity has has proven to be durable um through through many things but the church the church sometimes can can get to very small levels and we've seen the decline in europe of of christianity and sort of this christianity light that that tom holland talks about has seemed to have displaced much of Christianity, and there's just sort of a rump of a church that that endures, and this causes uh, Brits such as Tom Holland and 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 Douglas Murray to be anxious and worry that that if the if the if the memory gets too long, then you can sort of lose the whole thing. So I don't want to overplay my argument. Now in the second part. I am going to change focus and we're going to look a little bit more at, okay, kind of debunk the Nazi position that, well, you know, this, this racial genetic only idea, once again, Brett Weinstein wades in and notes the story verse is foundational. And we'll take a brief look at Robert Bella and his, his attempt to integrate religion in the story of human evolution just some some bits from the introduction there because robert bella also notes that it, it seems that you know as brett weinstein says this these two tracks both the genetic track and the cultural track and and robert bella notes that what happens very quickly is that the culture track doesn't stay isolated from the from the bottom track. It, of course, colonizes it. And this is a point that Jordan Peterson made many times that 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 the human story verse gets into the natural selection, and and you can't really pull them apart. They they you know they become intertwined, and in fact, very quickly the the culture track colonizes the other track. And and what we're seeing now in terms of fears about eugenics about artificial intelligence and some of these things well yeah that's that's the continued colonization of the genetic track but in the second part i'm going to pay play significant portions from a piece that came across the discord server today that julian had posted um uh, rust who thought 
moderating a conversation at the American Enterprise Institute where where they're talking about well will another religion sort of displace Christianity in American culture and it's certainly not it's certainly not the kind of atheism that Sam Harris and Matt Dillahunty are are proposing. Uh, will Christianity sort of recede as it did in Europe? Well, that doesn't seem to be happening. In fact, both will get both will both of the the writers and scholars that that will speak will note that no, we're we're incredibly religious, but we don't we don't quite know what's going on in this religiosity. And, and I think uh, Stephen Smith from Diego Law School is going to make the argument, I think, quite compellingly that there's sort of a parasitic relationship between them and the, the full-blown, established, institutional, dominant religions. So that's going to be in part two. And I'll release part two probably a few days after this, just in terms of uh, for the sake of time. So if you enjoyed part one, Stay tuned, part two is coming.